OK. So this is lecture 18 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, we're, it's kind of, again, cobbled together with two different but very much related topics. One, the first one we're going to be talking about is a few kind of cute tricks that you can pull with respect to the FFT. Okay? So as I described in lecture 17, the FFT is a very powerful tool. It saves computational cycles. It's very efficient. Um, it's used an awful lot in many applications because of these very positive attributes. What we want to do now is we want to figure out, are there little ways that we can take data and even further capitalize on the computational efficiency of this? So that's the first part. And then the second part is of this lecture talks about the idea of fixed point versus floating point arithmetic in uh, these implementations. So the first part, uh, let's, let's jump into it. So we saw about FFTs in the last lecture. Now we want to look at, OK, suppose we have a few scenarios. Like for instance, suppose I want to take the DFT of two real sequences. So what I mean to say. So let's say I have x1 of n, and I have x2 of n. And I want to take the DFT of them. So what are ways that I can apply the DFT? So both of them are real, right? And now, OK, the question is, what can I do? How can I, like, you know, like if I take the DFT, I can either do so let's say this is n points wide, n. and that's n points wide, dft, dft, and that's n, that's n. Or I can take the f of t, n point f of t, and get that, and I can get that. Is that the most computationally efficient way of doing it? <coughs> no, it's not. I would not do it this way if I want to be tricky. This is what you would do. So the trick is take x1 of n and add it to j times x2 of n. So what I'm doing here is, OK, so that's length n. That's length n. So now, because assuming both of these guys are real, and then take the endpoint FFT of that. So instead of doing two endpoint FFTs, I now just do the one. Apply it to a complex signal that, in fact, is x1 and x2 combined together. So I can do this. And you might say, OK, how does that help me? So now I have complex gobbledygook at the output, right? Mm, sort of. What happens is the following. Oh, you. What happens is we saw the following some time ago. What happens is there is a relationship between the real and imaginary components of the, of, uh, between, let's say, um, real, like, you know, the time domain and the frequency domain data. So, for instance, we c like, just like what I've written down here on this slide, what we can do is we know we, we can kind of reverse engineer. We can also extract data out, like x1 and x2, from the time domain data. Very easy. How do we do this in the frequency domain? And the answer is, so what is the frequency domain equivalent of this expression here? What's the frequency domain equivalent of this expression over here? Bless you. Bless you. And so the answer is this guy. And this guy. 
like let, let's let's go into a little bit more detail. So we know that x of n is going to be equal to x1 of n plus j x2 of n. That's our trick, right? And then we apply we take the DFT of that in order to get something. But that something is kind of useless to me because I don't want to find the DFT or the FFT of x of n. I want to find the FFT of x1 of n and x2 of n. So we know. Suppose that we take the endpoint FFT, endpoint FFT, and endpoint FFT. So let's say each one of these guys is individually, um, so we know that this guy here is going to be x of k, he's going to be x1 of k, and he's going to be x2 of k, right, individually. We also know that to get x1 of n, how do you get x1 of n from x? What you do is you take x of n, and then you add x of n complex conjugate, right? So that will make this guy, the imaginary part, negative, and divide by 2. How do you get x2 of n from x? x of n plus, no, sorry, minus complex conjugate of x of n divided by 2j. This will give you x2 of n. So now the answer is, how, what is this equivalent to in terms of DFTs or FFTs? And this is what you do. What you do is, let's say we take the DFT of x1 of n, right? And that's going to be equal to the DFT over 2. We know that the DFT is a linear operator. So we know that this guy here already is going to be x1 of k. And now we have dft of x of n plus the dft of x con complex conjugate n divided by 2. We know that this guy is going to be x of k. And how about this guy? He's going to be some sort of x, right? If we look at the slides, he's going to be x conjugate n minus k. That's one of the properties for the DFT. So what we've got at the end of the day is we now have an expression. We now have an expression where, essentially, in order to extract out what the FFT is of x1 of k, all I need to do is find out what the output of that combined signal, the FFT, is, take its complex conjugate, rotate it, add those two together, divide by 2, and that will give me x1 of, n, uh, x1 of k. Similarly, x2 of k is going to be equal to xk minus x complex conjugate n minus k divided by 2j. So these two expressions, so if you want to use just one FFT endpoint and you have two sequences of the same length and they're both real, this is what you would do. Okay? So that's trickery number one. Number two is suppose now you have a sequence that's of length 2n in length. What do you do? Take n, take n, 
And let's assume they're both real. You do the exact same thing. Oh, yes. So what you do is delete. So suppose you have now a sequence that is of length 2n. Let's suppose that it is real, all real. What you need to do is you take the first n samples, and then you have the second n samples. You call it x1 of n. You call it x2 of n. And you do the exact same thing as before. So that way, you can use an endpoint FFT on a 2 endpoint data sequence that is all real. And you save computationally. Because, because think about it. So what we've got is we have some sort of operator that operates on complex data and has very predictable properties that we can extract both imaginary and real data from. And if we only use real data, we're, only, we're not really making efficient use of this resource. So what we want to do is, if you really want to make efficient use of this resource, let's make these numbers complex. Let's stack together n real and, and another n real, but we designate it as imaginary. And then we know how to act, extract information from this format. And again, just to reiterate, x1 of k would be obtained from x of k using this expression. Oh. Right? So this is a very beautiful property. Because what we're using is, if, you, if you're given that opportunity, make your numbers complex, combine them together, put the FFT, and then extract them at the output. Enough said. OK? All right. And that's what I just talked about. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about like with the FFT in linear filtering and correlation. So we talked a little bit already about like overlap, add, and overlap, save. Actually, we talked a lot about, about overlap and add and overlap and save in lecture 16. So now what happens is we talk about, like we have that filter, h of n. We have an f of t that's of length l plus m minus 1. And we have the number of data samples being l. And we saw that before in lecture 16. And so we can do a little bit of zero padding to h of n in order to bring it up to the size n. And assuming that n is radix 2. So, so here's the thing. So let's say we know, let's say we, we want to choose an endpoint FFT that's radix 2. And I have a filter that's of length m. And let's say there's no prescribed length of blocks of data that I want. I choose l such that at the end of the day, n, which is equal to l plus m minus 1, is equal to radix 2. So that gives us a little bit of flexibility. So then what happens is, uh, with that, that format, I can then perform the filtering operation like I've done. And, from, and, and then afterwards, I can do the inverse DFT in order to get the output y of n from all of this. Okay. And, and a little bit more um, information, especially on the Gortzel algorithm and chirp z transform, that's available in sections 8.3.1 and 8.3.2 of your course textbook. OK. Right, what we're going to end off with this lecture, and it's a little bit more on, um, more on like the implementation side of the house, is this idea of quantization effects. But it's not quantization the way you think of it as. So what we're going to talk about, so you probably heard of this if you've taken a computer engineering class. You hear about floating point and fixed point representations, right? We, we often deal with, like, let's say you have an FPGA, so field programmable gate array. So it's like, you know, some sort of digital platform. Like, you know, you can implement a variety of different dig digital operations. What you can do with this, um, this FPGA, this field programmable gate array, is you can implement a variety of different functions, usually like filters um, or FFTs and, and who knows what. 
Uh, you can do some fancier stuff, but that depends on the choice of FFT platform. Uh, um, sorry, FPGA platform that you have. But in often, in a lot of cases, you have software out there. So if you let's say you play with MATLAB, um, almost everything, unless you explicitly say so, is going to be floating point operations, right? And so what what does that floating point mean? It means that you have a certain level of precision for your number. And that decimal place, you know, can, can shift around, um, like, you know, so let's say you have some sort of representation, um, you know, binary representation, and your, and your decimal, your radix point, um, as you're performing more and more mathematical operations using various floating point numbers, that decimal place can actually move around throughout the operation, right? So it doesn't just stay still. On a fixed point, on your hand, your radix, your decimal point, has to stay at the same place throughout all the operations. So this creates a lot of risk in terms of, let's say, if you do a computation, um, is there a risk that you lose precision? Like, you know, you do an operation, and then all of a sudden, oh, shoot, like I need a few more decimal places and such, but you don't have that available, right? So, we, so that is the fixed point operations that I'm talking about. And so when I talk about quantization effects, it's when I go from floating, floating point representation to fixed point representation. I begin to lose a certain level of precision when I go from floating point, where I have that variability of where the decimal place is, to fixed point. And what happens is what you design in MATLAB, or whatever software that you use on your PC, right, scientific computing and such, if you then translate it to hardware it says, I only do fixed point operations, you're going to lose a little bit of accuracy, right? This could be actually a very serious problem. Where in particular? We talked a little bit already about this in direct form one and direct form two representations of systems, where we talk about the IIR, or infinite impulse response, right? That feedback. So imagine each one of those coefficients is, going, is represented. Let's say you design a MATLAB, and they're all floating point, right? And then you convert it into fixed point. What is the problem? The problem is that now with that fixed point representation, my design is no longer what I designed it in MATLAB. It's slightly off. What happens if my design depends on those coefficients being as close to what I designed them to be as possible? Otherwise, I have instability issues. This is the problem that a lot of folks experience with respect to fixed point representation, is the fact that when you go from floating point to fixed point, you lose a little bit of that accuracy, and then bad things happen. So let's, let's look at the structure of floating point. So this is one standard for binary floating point representation, so IEEE standard 754. And what 754 says is that I'm going to have a sign bit. It's usually, um, you know, bit number um, three. And the sign bit tells me whether it's a minus one or a plus one, right? I'm going to have something called the mantissa, right? The mantissa is the part that is uh, before the, uh, the what you call it, before the um, decimal point, and then you have the exponent field. So you have, in this case, you have up to 30 bits, uh, sorry, 32 bits that represent a floating point number. So you have the sign bit, you have the mantissa, and you have the exponent field. And what, you, what, what happens is through this representation, and you notice that there's some variability, what you can do is you can create any one of these numbers with this sort of precision. And um, this is what MATLAB, this is what a lot of your desktop computing does. It, it uses this sort of format. But fixed point's a little bit different. So in fixed point arithmetic, what you've got is, essentially, you have an integer representation. So let's say you can represent a number by, let's say here is, let's say, b n minus 1, and its location is at b to the n minus 1. And you have all these guys going down to b to the 0. So each bit represents, OK, here's this value, this value, this value, this value, 
And then there's also a fractional component, and for n bits, right? So what sometimes you can do is you can say, I have 15 bits for the integer part and 15 bits for the rational, the decimal part, right? But notice there is no variability. Like your, your decimal point is snugly in between those two sets of 15 bits, as opposed to this guy here where that decimal point can really occur anywhere that you define it to be, right? So that's the power of floating point. You can add as much or as little precision as you want. You can move that decimal point to the left or to the right, but fixed point on your hand, boom. It stays there, and it's always going to stay there throughout this operation. Right? So what happens is fixed point does have better resolution, um, but it also has this issue of overflow. So overflow is what I was talking about. Let's say you perform some sort of binary, some sort of arithmetic with it. And then it's like, at some point, like you compute a value that exceeds the precision of your fixed point representation, and things don't make sense anymore. That's, over, that's the over, overflow that I'm talking about. Floating point's a little bit more difficult because you can always move that decimal point and add resolution and not worry about it as much. So that and converting from floating point to fixed point, these are the two major concerns of fixed point. So what we want to do is we want to minimize that impact on, let's say, any sort of digital signal processing implementation. And so what we want to do is we want to sort of figure out, OK, um, let's suppose we have some sort of DFT, and we do the multiplications and additions using this, this expression, which we all should know. And so what ends up happening is if we, let's say, we have these multiplications with the real and imaginary components of x and, omega, and, and w and kn, and then add them together, and let's say each one's represented by b bits, then remember that each complex multiplication is equal to four times the real multiplications, right? And what happens is each multiplication is rounded from 2 to the b to b bits. And what happens is since there are n of these complex mul multiplications in a DFT, we actually have now 4n real multiplications, which means we have 4n the amount of quantization error, right? And so when we have that, we have, that's where the quantization error kicks in. So when we go, like in the case of the DFT, and we have all, like, you know, these n operations, we have n fixed point representations, what ends up happening is we're going to get some sort of error, a, a small amount of quantization error relative to the floating point representation. So how is that so? So first of all, we're assuming that the quantization errors are due to rounding and that they are uniformly distributed in the quantization region. So again, just like before, like when we looked at sampling and quantization and delta sigma, sorry, sigma delta, that we have uniformly distributed quantization error. That anywhere in the continuum of the signal, when we quantize it, that, um, that, that the quantization error is equally likely to occur anywhere between delta over 2 and, and minus delta over 2. And then that 4n quantization errors are mutually uncorrelated, which I think I mentioned in a few examples in the problem sets earlier today and yesterday, that the, the quantization errors, the correlation between one point and another, there shouldn't be. They should be uncorrelated with each other. Like, what the, coral, un, co, uh, the, equaliza, the, sorry, the quantization error at one point should be totally uncorrelated for the quantization error at another point. And then finally, the quantization errors should be uncorrelated with respect to the input signal x of n. So given all of that, you know, first of all, we have the quantization error. And you might say, where the heck did delta squared over 12 comes from? So what is the PDF of a uniform random variable? Because remember, the quantization error is a uniform random variable, right? So what we're doing here is we're trying to find the variance of the quantization error. So what you do in order to find the quantization error variance is you, you, you integrate 
So what you're trying to find is the expectation, or no, sorry, not the expectation. So what you're trying to do is you take the PDF, you take the variable squared. If it's zero mean, great. If not, you have to subtract off the mean, and then you integrate it across from minus infinity to infinity to give you that. And, th and so what ends up happening is this guy here is nothing more than the variance of a uniform random variable. You plug in what delta is equal to, and then that in turn, what happens is when you have 4n the number of multiplications, that's big. That's a lot of quantization error. And so it continues down, and what this tells us is that every time n increases by four times, and an additional bit for in, compu in computational precision is needed. Right? So what happens is, what this tells us, Okay. is that, first of all, we calculate what is the quantization error. And so the first thing we need to do is we want to find out what the variance is of that quantization error. We know it's uniform. So what is the variance of a uniform random variable? That's where we get that value upstairs, right? the delta squared over 12. We replace delta with, uh, with, with what it, like, you know, with, um, uh, two to the minus b. Then from there, we we get what the like, you know what the quanti the variance of the quantization er error is from the four n multiplications. So we take the quantization variance, right, the uh, sigma e squared, and multiply by four n, which is a lot. And then we rewrite that expression. We plug in what sigma e squared is. And at the end of the day, we get something that looks rather complicated. But what this tells us is that whenever we add an additional bit in computation, like, you know, whenever we, every time we, the n increases, we have an additional bit in um, precision that's needed. OK? So you can find out a little bit more about this also in section 8.4.2 in your course textbook. But let, let's look at the big picture. Let's take a step back. So whenever we do things like fixed point representation, part of it is because of the simplicity of the hardware. If you want floating point, that's great, but you're going to pay for it with a more expensive platform that has to do floating point arithmetic. If you do fixed point, it makes things a little bit more computationally efficient. You don't have as much demands on the hardware. But the consequences are things like this. So you need to be aware that you will have a little bit of quantization. You'll have a little bit of rounding. You know, you have to accommodate for the discrepancy going from floating point to fixed point. Now, the next thing also on top of that is things like what I mentioned about IIR filters and, and how it influences, let's say, uh, your design. Let's say you have a filter that's designed precisely to have, uh, let's say, specific nulls or notches or some sort of frequency characteristic. Imagine if you now convert it to fixed point, you might lose those beautiful properties that you so carefully designed. So that really is the challenges behind going from floating point into fixed point. And so what this characterized here, this little back of the envelope calculation that I presented here today, um, what this tells us is that, um, you know, every t like, you know, let's say you take your run-of-the-mill DFT and uh, you go from floating point to fixed point. Um, now what happens is you have to be worried about precision and the impact of the quantization that occurs when you're going from floating point to fixed point. All right. So with that, um, th that, concludes, that concludes lecture 18. All right. So we definitely had a lot.